isn't your average podcast. But then again, David Sobel isn't your typical business and finance attorney. For your consideration and appreciation, get ready to get serious. It's the Proven Resources Get Serious Podcast with attorney and author David Sobel. So test, test. Can you hear it? Hi, Nance. Hi, How you doing? David. I'm well. How you are you? You woke up today, right? I woke up. It's a <laughs> well, glorious glad, morning. I'm glad that you woke up. <laughs> so that was kind of funny, right? Yes. Like, person of value. That's she right. Sleep, she sleeps in. Yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to be here by a certain time. But who else of your staff is here on a Saturday I morning, gotcha. David? I understand. Bright and early. You know how I am. That's right. Want to be up early. Got to catch all those worms. That's right. So you know what's so funny? When you walk in, I'm, what am I doing? I'm bitching about... I'm not really <laughs> bitching, but I was a little... Yeah, I get a call from somebody this morning, just yes. so we let, let our listening audience know. Uh, I get a I get a call this morning from somebody who bought a very substantial commercial piece of property. Very substantial, very like over a million bucks. Mm-hmm. And um, she's she and her husband are frantic because uh, they have a bunch of tenants in the property. And the first thing I said to her is, "Well, who was your attorney that helped you with this? Yeah. Did you buy the property with the the leases, knowing that you're going to have tenants?" She says, "No, the tenants were supposed to be out, oh, and she's good. represented by." Two realtors, two different realtors. Mm-hmm. This is a commercial real estate transaction. And that's a significant amount. Now, you always hear me. I tell people, I never count your money. I just, it's yes. the mechanics of how things work. You know, it, it could be a $100,000 commercial property or a residential property, or it could be a million dollar property uh, or several million dollars in this case. But have an attorney for Christ, of her Pete's sake, right? Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. That's, that's not to worry, David. Okay. But um, <laughs> we're so, real here. Yeah, we got to be authentic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, it's so interesting is how. It, so I asked her, well, what, what prevented you? Like, why did you not have an attorney? First thing she said, which is common, I hear a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought my realtor would take care of any of my concerns. Okay. I, I, I love good realtors. You know that. Yes, you do. I lo- like any profession, there's good and bad. Mm-hmm. But not everybody, with all due respect to those good realtors, realtors are, are great salespeople. That's their job, to sell you a piece of property. That's right. They do have certain requirements under the law as to the, what they have to do for you. Uh, but one of the things they, they certainly don't do is they don't practice law. Okay. So, we, How many times have we heard I know, this, David? I, know. I mean, how many times? Well, I'm not here to lecture. You know, I always say I do my best lecturing at home. Yeah, but, um, and your children agree. Yeah. <laughs> my children agree. But it is kind of crazy because now she has uh, six tenants that she has to um, get rid of. We have no idea about the leases. And... Um, mm. Oh. It is very common. So let me ask you. Sure. She bought this. Bu- she and her husband bought this building. Their existing mm. tenants. Uh, what happens to their existing leases? We don't know. For, okay. First of all, that's a really good question. So when you have leases um, that are in existence, sometimes depending on the purchase agreement. See, this is a phone call today. I'm going to need to have uh, the ability to review the documentation. Certainly. But. Depending on how the purchase agreement is drafted up, uh, the provisions could say you're taking the property subject to the leases. Meaning, if there's a, uh, several leases that are in uh, in effect, mm-hmm. and the people are paying on time, and there's no issues, well, you could take the property, let's say, on January 1st. But those tenants' leases may not expire for a year, two years, or three years. So if you agree to take a property subject to leases... That's a problem, especially if you intend to be, you as the buyer, intend to be the end user. Mm-hmm. Now, I have to share with you, most people don't purchase a significant piece of property like that, from what I just told you, yeah. without the help of an attorney. Too bad for us. <laughs> well, no, that's okay. I mean, I'd rather, you know, most people, actually our job, most attorneys' jobs, uh, Unfortunately, is cleaning up after messes, mm-hmm. as you know. I've told you before, but the the better way, I think, most good attorneys would say, we would prefer that we do the due diligence that protects you or the client, so that they don't have these issues. And this is a really, based on what I'm hearing, it's a pretty rinky-dink 
uh, issue that could have been resolved rather quickly. And we've heard in the news, mm -hmm. the thing that popped in my mind was um, Harry the Hatter. Boy, I heard that little beep. Is oh. that what you said? You <laughs> that was my mind. Yeah, Harry the Hatter. Harry, yeah, Harry the Hatter. What happened with Who him? Who had been... Oh, yeah, Harry the Hatter. Down, was it Harry Down. or Henry? Uh, it's either Harry or Henry. We, okay. I'm, I apologize. Uh, um, he's an iconic, uh, iconic storefront, right? In downtown Detroit. A haberdashery. A haberdashery. Right. My father, uh -huh. you know, purchased hats down there when hats were the thing. Right. Well, I think it was late, you know, mid last year. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, after, you know, what, fifty plus years, uh -huh. Harry's building mm -hmm. was sold, and Harry was being evicted. Right. Now, Harry may, I, I don't know. He wasn't evicted, but he didn't want to pay what the new, oh, sure. what the new landlord is. Sure. So he was looking for a new place. And depend, I, I don't want to comment on him in particular, but like right. for an example, uh, you know, we deal with a lot of real estate investors, mm -hmm. some small, some medium, some large, right? And uh, in that instance, uh, that had, we'll just call it the storefront, the store right? Front, yes. The storefront may not have even had a lease with his old landlord mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the city wasn't doing so well and now that things are picking up uh, you have new there's a new sheriff in town as I like to say yes, and there now is. they're demanding rent so number one they may just want would have wanted uh, to get a lease with him maybe he didn't have a lease yeah uh, he was month to month and he didn't choose to stay after that because you can leave in 30 days you know just give notice if right. it's month to month you can walk away yep. just pay your last month's rent or you have um, a proposed lease by the new owner and that those provisions in that lease could be more restrictive. He's not used to it. You know, he's mm -hmm. been there for a while. Yeah. Uh, it requires an increase in rent or, you know, more obligations. Uh, within the rent, he could be required to pay what they call CAM. He could mm -hmm. be required to pay insurance um, for the building, his portion of certain items, insurance, water bill, etc. Oh. So, you know, different provisions. New, a new sheriff in town, he decided to leave. He did find a nice new place. Yeah, I'm right sure. So yeah, I, 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 somewhere I, down by Eastern Market where there's a lot of regentrification. Sure, right. Going on. Well, you know, it's funny that we're talking about Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, any given day during the week, uh, I have uh, inquiries for, for assistance. I'll give you a, a great example. I just uh, finished up a file where I had a young couple purchasing a uh, newly renovated home from an out-state investor. Okay, oh. so this just happened. Um, and the out-of-state investor, uh, yeah, they had a purchase agreement. There were realtors involved in that one. And the investor decided, well, geez, I, th I just got an offer, a higher offer, uh, for the property than what this young couple was purchasing it for. So he precluded my clients from uh, letting the mortgage appraisal company come in uh. to inspect the property. It's crazy. And yeah. so, you know, you have to get involved. Those things are little, like pick up the phone and you kind of, you don't read them the riot act. I don't, I prefer, as you know, I don't really read the riot act. I'd rather yeah. speak with whoever's in charge and kind of give them the... You throttle them with kindness. Well, not th <laughs> throttle. You're there to kill. <laughs> I, I, no, I kind of just laid it out, laid out as it is. I you mean, did. you know, you can do it one way. You know, I heard that th phone call. <laughs> sure. Oh, did you? You did lay it out. Oh, okay. Right? The easy. We can do it the easy way or the hard way, mm -hmm. and I prefer to do it the easy way for everybody's sake. Yeah. Because it's expensive, and there's something called um, the law of diminishing return, and that is. If, if there's a contract or something that's in play and one party wants to leave or get out of the contract, if the provisions of the contract are pretty much, especially in real estate, are, you know, everybody's performing, but you're just trying to get out because, let's say, you're going to get an, a higher price from somebody else, like a back-up offer, right. well, Michigan courts are very much against that. Uh, in fact, if that's the only reason you're trying to cancel a, a contract and, uh, let's say, the purchaser, one of the parties, is not completely complying with the agreement. They might be delayed by time, let's say, in, okay. in, in, in performing their obligation. Uh, courts are very reluctant to step in and uh, cause that contract to be what we call expired or terminate the contract. If, if everybody is in good faith moving forward with a, an agreement, and let's say the time's been delayed, if it's a couple weeks, Usually you'll have to close. Um, if if the seller, let's say, finds somebody else 
to buy the uh, the home for a higher amount mm -hmm. or to buy the, it could be a commercial piece of property as well well in that situation if the seller tries to inhibit or become a uh, uh, interfere interfere with let's say the uh, due diligence process that the buyer is trying to perform okay. well you can't you can't use that. The seller cannot use that uh, from a delay to say, well, hey, the purchaser is not complying. Yeah, so That's good to know right. for us in Michigan. Right. Well, it's actually, it's kind of common sense, too. Uh, yes. But, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're, everybody's in compliance except, you know, somebody's trying to get a higher value of a property, and you, they start interfering with the process in order to cause the purchaser, uh, you know, prevent them from getting a property. In performing under the agreement, mm -hmm. well, that's that's not right, right? I it's agree. Common sense. So, uh, but there's actually case law on that, and so sometimes when people don't have an attorney, that's something people turn to an attorney for to kind of pick up the phone and call the broker, call the selling agent, and say, you know, we're happy to work with you, but if you're going to step on my client's rights, we're going to see you in court. And that's called the law of diminishing return because it's actually more expensive to litigate than it is just to let the transaction move forward. For what? A difference of $20,000 or right. 30000 on a price? So that's kind of what I just finished up uh, earlier this week. Cool. But, um, you know... It's kind of nice to see you. We're going to change the topic. It's nice to see you today. We haven't it's done this. It's good in like to a, see you again. Yeah, we haven't done this in a year. I know. You I know? miss doing it. I thought um, I thought we were done with these, and then you actually because we've been so busy with yes. so many different things, uh, and then whoops, and um, then you brought it up in December. Said you know I really like them. I kind of like it too. Yeah. You know, I and mean, we're so busy. We do um, well. We always go to the um, the RIA, the National Real Estate Investors Association meeting once a month. Exactly. Um, Dylan Tanaka runs that over in Macomb, and he always has us either speak or, or uh, be members of uh, lead a roundtable, as they call mm -hmm. for the real estate investors. So we like that. That's a that's a wonderful. It's group. always a great a, great time. A good field trip. Right, <laughs> and then <laughs> a field trip. Uh, Paul Benzman uh, just started a uh, large blog talk radio program uh oh you were telling me yeah you were, you were on his i was on his show. and uh hopefully you're going to be on um that again uh Terrific. every you know on a monthly basis for the real estate and business hour that they're running mm -hmm. what else are we doing oh we have uh next month in february we have two things we have the first would be uh, I'm going to be appearing on like the Power Hour for Law or the Law Power Hour. I'll put that up wow. on the website. <laughs> right. I haven't heard about this. Yeah, that's, uh, that was interesting. I got that call from uh, Deanne Williams, who uh, is a producer. And that's, I think it's called the Law Hour Power or the Hour Power of Law. Well, I'll, I'll put it Whatever up online. Whatever it is. It I'm going to be cool. there. Yeah, I'll show up. You'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, that's not a podcast. That's actually a TV show. So it's You're local. Be on TV. Oh, yeah. Wow, I got a, cool. I got a powder in my shiny head. I have a face for radio. <laughs> I definitely don't have a face for television. And then, um, what else? Oh, and then the most important thing that we're doing uh, starting yes. February 20th is we're doing a webinar uh, over a six-month period of time. It's called Six and Six. Yeah, this is an exciting project. Yeah, I'm enjoying it's pretty cool. It. And that is um, a program where every month, it's actually geared towards women. It's called it a, is, uh, yes. you're, you're the one who kind of created, created the concept, uh, and you're working with Madeline Krieger on it as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, we have around 12 current presenters, and we're going to try and build that up even more. But uh, the whole idea behind the, uh, the six and six is that people are really busy, and they don't have time to sit for a whole yeah. day. Especially yeah. if it snows. Right. Or if it rains. Right. Or if it's a nice day. Right. Like it was yesterday. It was 40 degrees, and it was really... I had my sunroof open halfway. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> I was coming back from a deposition with Nicole, oh. and I had my arm out the window, and I'm like, something's really weird. I, you know you know how you hang your arm out the window yeah. when it's a nice day? I'm like, this is kind of mm. this is kind of weird. And Nicole says, why don't you... Put the you know put the sunroof up, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, I guess I will. Yeah. It was 45 degrees and sunny. I'll yeah. take it. Michiganders. Yeah. So what happened there? Oh, so the six and six is a um, a webinar that is for two hours once a month for the next six months, where the presenters t uh, talk to the audience uh, uh, about finances, uh, about real estate, about insurance, about um, personal growth. 
uh, careers. And what we've tried to do, it's all geared towards women, but men can join too, of course. Uh, we have several men speakers or male speakers. Yes. Uh, hopefully that's okay. It's okay. It's all right. I vetted them already. Uh, you already vetted them. And um, the whole idea with that, again, is just to give people good information, but not to wear them out, you know, not to not to overwhelm people, because uh, you can do those, you know, seminars at, let's say, a community college and be there all day. Right. But, but the job is to educate and give people good information uh, on so many different areas, like how to buy a home, how to open a... Uh, uh, investment account. I, I have, uh, mm -hmm. I think we, uh, Kim Arnett, who works for uh, Edward Jones, she's an investment advisor. She's going to be presenting um, how to buy long term care insurance. That's going to be with Ari Katz over at Ameriprise. Uh, so we have all these different people who are volunteering their time. It's free. The Which whole is great. the whole webinar is free. Uh, we, we were going to make it a webinar uh, in the sense that you could, it's a seminar. You know, you know that I didn't like webinar. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but people could come in and sit and watch the presenters, mm -hmm. you know, face to face. But this it's starting to be everybody likes the idea of a webinar where they can sit, you know, on at home and put their feet up on the couch and be just in listen. Pajamas, yeah, be in their you know, PJs. It's a wonderful thing, right? And and, and, and the technology is there. Back. They can, yeah. which is why I love webinars. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think back to when I was a young woman mm -hmm. when dinosaurs still walked the earth. Uh -huh. And I wouldn't have been able to buy a home by myself. Um, I would have never thought to have my own investment account. Right. You know, those are things that you That's do right. when you get married. Right. It's um, a different day, it's right? A different it's a different day. day. And day. it's now's the time. And young women growing up now are so bright. And it's really exciting that we're doing this. Yeah. Um, it, it should be fun. We're doing it matter-of-factly. And, you know, they'll be able to ask, ask questions. Oh, yeah. The technology is great. They can, you know, they can type in their questions type or in. they can go online and we can see them as yes. well. I don't know how many people are going to do that, but... I won't be doing yeah. it. Oh, no, well, I'll be here. Yeah, you'll be on it. <laughs> You're going to actually be on it. So am I. And uh, we have some help from a couple uh, good people. Alex Wolf is helping us with light and sound. And, Thank goodness. And uh, Madeline's helping us with uh, the moderation just with the um, when people type in. That's great. But, yeah, it's it's it should be I'm interesting. Excited. Yeah. I'm excited. No I, one else is doing this that I know of in this area. Well, there are some things that... I, they're a little airy fairy. And well, if they I do, like it's a matter of fact. Yeah. Well, you know, I give them the information, give people, you know, what they're looking for, uh, and if, if if it's not covered, then they have access to uh, other resources that we provide. That's why you know the company's called Proven Resource, and uh, it gives people great legal and financial information um, so that they can reduce risk and uh, really. Um, legal expense. I mean, that, that's right. really the idea. They're going to so. be able to go online and get your three new books. Oh, yeah. Is well, I don't have three new exciting. books, but I just, I mean, it's been a busy it's couple been months, it. right? See, this is why we have not yeah. done our radio show. Yeah, well, that's right, because I've been kind of busy. Yeah, I came out with a new book. Actually, now I'm plugging my own book, but because uh, okay. it's my show, I guess I can do that. That's right. It's called... Um, uh, what's keeping you up at night? Uh, the an attorney's practical approach to debt and loan nightmares, and it's you know based on gosh, almost 25 years experience dealing with lending and mm -hmm. uh, financial uh, documentation and agreements and what, what people come up against and how to overcome those problems. And so you've been on both sides of the table. I still so am on both yeah. sides of the table. I That's mean, true. I, I tell people all the time, I, I represent lenders, I represent investors, I represent individuals. It, you know, so long as there's no conflict mm -hmm. uh, of interest, we call it, yeah, I, you know, it's fine. It's kind of like when you go... Uh, you've, you'll hear about a prosecutor becoming a defense attorney. When you know both sides, when you're a former business insider or a bank insider like myself, mm -hmm. it makes the job easier when I have to defend somebody or prosecute a matter on behalf of an individual. So I like doing it. It, it yeah. adds a level of comfort for our clients, too, because yeah. they know that you really know what to anticipate. Well, try. Yeah. We try. You did a pretty good job. Okay, so the whole idea of this seminar, or not seminar, uh, this <laughs> podcast is really, it's called Asked and Answered. It's 2018. It's been a year since we've really it done has. one. Um, is to go through some of the more recent questions that we get every week and, and you know, our readers of the newsletter, uh, if they're not in the newsletter, they'll email me. So I just am happy email to... email me. Yeah, they email you at uh, n 
Phillips at provenresource.com. There's uh, resources singular, it's not yes. plural. And two L's in Phillips. Right, two L's in Phillips. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I'm happy that we're doing this. So Great. why don't we do this? Uh, the old format, which is going to be the same as the new format, <laughs> or the new format is going to be the same as yes. the old format. We're just going to uh, go through some questions that people have, and I'll try and answer them. And um, yeah. that's it. I okay. pulled two recent ones that okay. are kind of interesting. Actually, they're very interesting. Um, okay, this comes from John A. in White Lake, Michigan. Um, John says, I own a commercial property. The retail tenant is three months behind. Can a landlord cash a part of partial payment and still start an eviction? The answer is yes. Um, it depends when they send out the notice and everything. Uh, for, you know, if you're the, the landlord, mm -hmm. um, just to round it up, let's say the rent is $2,000 a month. And you're about to evict and they bring in only a thousand well you have to credit as the landlord you have to credit the thousand dollars to the account but you you know they're still delinquent so you can start your eviction definitely mm -hmm. and normally what happens is then when you do the eviction when you go down to court I my experience has always been a good judge will ask the parties is there any way that the parties can make uh, some type of resolution or settle the matter you know there, I prefer it that way, uh, but there's a lot of, you know, can be a lot of animosity between the parties uh, by the time they get to court. Uh, there are times, uh, again, as representing both the tenant as well as the uh, landlord, there are times that tenants may have a valid reason why they haven't paid rent. So uh, a landlord should be prepared that when they go to court, if that tenant brings up the issues such as, hey, you know what, uh, we, have a, we have a lease but I'm not getting heat, and I own a restaurant. Yes. And how can I have a restaurant without heat? You know, mm -hmm. that becomes a factual uh, concern, and it's something that would probably go to, they call it trial. I mean, it would go to trial. And the, the trier of fact is the judge. So basically the judge would say, is that true? And if there's contention there, the judge may have a, a little trial. You know, yeah. show me your evidence. But nine times out of ten, a good judge will say, if that's true, landlord, you know, can you guys go outside and fix this? You know, the attorneys, let's figure this out. Okay. Um, but what if the tenant's required to pay for the heat? Oh. Right, I mean, that I happens too, that right? Way, I mean, right. so, you know, if, if it's the tenant's responsibility, <laughs> then there's no real, you know, it's not a valid defense. So a tenant can come to a hearing with valid defenses. One of them is payment. So that question, well, I paid. Well, how much did you pay? Are you paid in full? Mm -hmm. You know, so the question really, you know, when, when I initiate an eviction action on behalf of a landlord or an investor, is I, I really want to know what has been paid. And if during the time frame that uh, the notice has gone out to evict and the time of the hearing, if there has been some payments that have been made but they're not in full and have not brought the file current, mm -hmm. Uh, or the uh, payments current, you still go to court and you just acknowledge, yes, you know what, Your Honor, they're still behind, but they only owe uh, one month instead of three months. I still want payment. Okay. So there's no way to protect against that any other way. Otherwise, you know, you'd start a hearing and have to stop a hearing the minute somebody sent in one or two dollars, right. right? Can a landlord refuse to take a partial payment? A landlord can refuse payment, partial okay. payment, uh, because, well, first... You know, in in the leases, there'll be a provision that says no partial payment. Oh, right? okay. Everything's you know, everything is, uh, in in real estate especially, is really guided by the the provisions of a contract. So any type of contract related to real estate that exceeds one year should and, and should and must be in writing. Okay, that's called the statute of frauds. It prevents people from, you know, relying on memory. We want everything reduced to writing. So the answer to that question is uh, look at the provisions of your lease. All the time, Nancy, I know that you hear it. I know that Cole hears it. Denise hears it. Yes. Uh, you know, I'll be on the phone with people, and I'll, the first thing I say is send me over your documents. Do you have a, pro you know, where's your lease? Where's exactly. your purchase agreement? Where's your... You know, land agreement, whatever the agreement is, I gotta see it. Mm -hmm. And I, it's unfortunate, but people think that 
you know, we can give general, quick general information, but then you learn, you know, when somebody asks, oh, well, tell me about this, then you find out that they weren't doing whatever it is that you're, you're talking to them about and that they don't have a written lease or that they don't have the right provisions in the contract. I'm always talking about that. Which is know. a good segue why some people, um, I know some people get agitated mm. when you say, you have to come in and you have to bring your paperwork. Oh, they say, yeah. why can't you just answer on the phone? Right. But it's kind of like going to the doctor. <laughs> okay. I don't, first of all, uh, you know, if I'm inviting people in, it's because I, I think that there is something there, of course. But, you know, it's a great question and consider like the same equivalent as going to a doctor. Do you pick up the phone and call the doctor and say, hey, I have this pain in my knee. Can you tell me what it is over the phone? Same thing. The problem, it's no different, I guess, for doctors because they have that WebMD and there's all this information now online. Teledoc. Oh, yeah. And we have that oh, part of our insurance. Okay. Well, you know, if you think about it, uh, there are a lot of people who misdiagnose themselves all the time, right? Oh, they, they, I do it on a regular basis, sure. David. I, I, forget, I think there's actually a, <laughs> I think there is actually a, um, what you call, a, uh, I forgot what they call it, Nancy, but it's uh, almost like its own disease of people misdiagnosing themselves. No, 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 seriously. They, they go in and they go, oh, my goodness, I have a brain tumor. And the doctor's like, well, how did you learn that you had a brain tumor? Well, I, I saw it on, on you know, I diagnosed myself on WebMD. And then the, the doctor's like, well, no, no, you don't have a brain tumor. You, you've been taking this, and you should yes. be doing this, you know. Don't do that again. Dr. Google. Right. Something, right. Good old well, Dr. Google. People have that same issue when, when it comes to law. Um, I'll give you a great example example, which mm -hmm. just cracked me up. I had a lady come in uh, with her husband mm -hmm. on a business uh, matter that they were fighting over with another party, and um, she was very definite on how the law worked, and she was very well schooled in the, in the sense that she got a lot of information. I think the, the internet's good for the basics, yes. but, you know, experienced attorneys know better, and she came in told me, you know, everything about the case and how she wanted it pursued. And I, I'm looking at her and I'm like, that that doesn't work that way. And she cites this case. I mean, it's a little bit more intense. And she cited this case and I'm like, uh, that's not how it works in Michigan. And she looks at me, and, you know, as serious as, as it gets. And she says, yes, it is. Well, first, I don't really, I, don't, I do mind being challenged by somebody who is not an attorney. Um, but I still respect, you know, what they say. I just don't like being challenged right yes. So I'm looking at her. I grab the paperwork. I, well, I don't grab it. I asked her to see the paperwork she's relying on. And I'm looking at this matter. And I look up and I'm like, this is a Canadian case. <laughs> this is from Canada. <laughs> I mean, We're the, close, but not that right. close. <laughs> I mean, people do that all the time. I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining yes. that it happens quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I want to see people's paperwork when they come in. <coughs> and also, if they don't have it, you know, sometimes they don't have it. So guess what? Bring what you got, and we'll fill in the rest. You know, mm -hmm. just come in with something yes. that can kind of show that you have a case. Right. You know, so on the phone, yeah, a lot of people get really reluctant, but that's just human nature. Human nature. You know, yeah. it, but... Uh, uh, as you know, I write in the anecdotes newsletter every month some type of parable or some type of yeah. an anecdote, right, an anecdote. about, you know, uh, law is, our history, our legal history goes back, you know, I think it's 1088, or is it 1033, I can't recall, but it goes back that far, especially in real estate. Wow. So a lot of the principles that we practice today in law, they've been codified, they've been, you know, there are statutes, etc., but a lot of the ideas... And the theories come from uh, medieval England and, you know, uh, medieval law, how things were done in England. Which is fascinating. Because, you mm -hmm. know, we are in, uh, we're, it's an American j judicial system, but it comes from England originally, you know. So how, how the Internet, how you can look at 10 minutes of, of text and content on the Internet and believe you're an expert when there's thousands of case, you know, cases that uh, basically kind of rule on how things should happen or procedurally how things you know should progress well 10 minutes of re reading an internet uh, blog is not going to help you so that wall of books that we have here is is definitely more than that and, and those are supplemented every every month just so you know with new case law so um, 
case law actually defines how we practice. Yeah, there's a Latin word for it, but it doesn't really matter right now. Cool. Anyways, um, I've got another question sure. here. Okay. Go right ahead. Um, this is from Jessica, who lives in Detroit. How do I acquire property where the owner is unknown and it has been vacant for 10 years? Oh, I bet this happens a lot. Well, right, mm -hmm. um, especially in Detroit. Right. It's actually a very popular uh, question. The first thing I would say, her question is, how do I acquire? Yes, oh. she wants to purchase. Oh. Um, I actually did speak to her on the phone, uh -huh. and she has found a really cool old house. Mm-hmm. And um, but it definitely has been vacant, okay. and she wants to buy it. Well, there's a couple things. Number one, uh, you, if she's buying the property, she's looking to buy it. Uh, she's going to have to go down to the uh, county records mm -hmm. and find out who would own it. And this, you don't need an attorney for this. This is something you can have a realtor do, or you can do it yourself. You go down to the county, have them pull the property records, and it will show who was the last owner of the property. And if you're trying to get that property, you would, you know, just write a letter. Hey, I'm interested in buying the home. If I remember, she has tried that, and the owner is unknown. Okay. Well, that's problematic, but you'd have to, you know... You know, the only way that you could get the property is either by purchasing it from the owner or uh, perhaps the in the, this situation, if the property was abandoned, she would pick up the property at, let's say, a tax sale or a foreclosure sale. But, you know, okay. she'd have to wait. You can't just walk in and just wait, you know, wait to buy a property if if nobody wants to sell it to you or if it's not been taken back by the city or the uh, municipality. Mm -hmm. You're out of luck. All you can do is keep sending a, a letter, etc. However, let's say she, this is a long shot, it's called adverse possession, mm -hmm. where she, uh, for a period of 15 years, I think it's 15 now, 14 or 15, um, is using the property, property open, in the open, okay. and they call it hostile, uh, showing uh, adverse, hostile means adverse, where um, she's using it the way she would want to use the property and she's using it in the open she's not hiding her use so other people could see including an owner of the property and if she did this and she did it continuously for a matter of years she could then go to court and file an action for adverse possession to get the property but that's a long time so she could actually now let me understand yeah. this mm -hmm. It's a home. She mm -hmm. wants it. So she could go in, start doing repairs, oh, yeah. get utilities in her name, mm -hmm. deck this place out beautifully, mm -hmm. and someone could knock on the door on the 14th, years from yeah, now yeah. and say, so adverse possession. Job in my house. Right. Adverse possession. Well, okay. So adverse possession in Michigan is actually 15 years. I think I said 14. I think Ohio is 14. But uh, Michigan's 15. Anyway, so in that period of time, yeah, you're taking a risk. It doesn't really, I mean, it works like that. You could be using the property for, you know, 14 years and nine months. And then somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm the owner, and uh, you need to leave. Now, they wouldn't be able to just boot them out. They'd have to evict them. Okay, that's number one. But the owner is just exerting their rights. And one of the, one of the um, hostile, or uh, that one of the, uh, elements of adverse possession it doesn't happen often, uh, but is without permission. So all um, openly uh, hostile, continuous these elements are all fine until the seller comes in or the owner comes in and goes, you know what? You have my permission to use this for one day, or one hour, or one minute. The way to undermine adverse possession or a claim to adverse possession is just grant permission. And so I have had people call me up, especially with easements, like somebody will be, they call it easement by prescription, mm -hmm. which is another form of adverse possession where somebody's, let's say, using a trail on somebody's property. In Michigan, we have a lot of hunting, right, yes. up north. Uh, there's a lot of hunting areas. Well, I've had people say, gosh, somebody every year comes hunting on my uh, property. I'm like, well, how many years have they been doing it? Well, I don't like them doing it, they say, but yeah. they've been coming on for the past 12 years. Well, guess what? If that person did it continuously, like it's a pattern, uh, for, let's say, the 12 years, and, you know, in September, they're always going on the property. It's open. It's 
hostile to the owner. That means it's adverse to the owner, mm -hmm. and it's continuous, that 12-year period. It doesn't have to be continuous use every day. It's just continuous over a certain period right. of time. Well, they could claim that they had an easement. It's called easement by prescription. Yeah. So how do you stop that? Well, you just put a barrier, like not, not, nothing to hurt anybody, but you just put a, um, like a road cross sign or whatever, the, you know, those, oh, uh, like a railroad the crossing, gate. Yeah, the yeah. gate. You say, you, and you put a sign up there, uh, you do not have permission to use this trail. That stops it. Now, you'd really want to give people notice, and uh, when that person comes back on the property, you give them notice or mail it to them if you knew who they were. Yeah. So adverse possession, which is not as common as people think. However, I would think uh, I'd have to look it up. I guess there's more actions now, especially when Detroit's coming back more. If you really want a piece of property, you have to file an action for adverse possession. And, you know, you're going to probably have somebody contest that. But if they don't show up, guess what? If you've met all the elements, open, again, open, hostile, continuous. Um, those, are, those are the elements, primary elements that prevent people, uh, the owners, from actually over a certain period of time from getting their property back. That's really yeah. interesting, David. <laughs> I, I really, yeah. Did I over talk? No, so. that's really, um, wow. Yeah. I guess because, you know, we both know Detroit and we know that... Um, it doesn't just happen in Detroit, though. But it you know, happens I everywhere. I guess we're thinking about it mm -hmm. and, the, well, we could be talking about Pontiac. It's going through a regentrification. Yeah. It's great. It's wonderful, but mm -hmm. to think that I—I I guess I'm not that brave to go mm -hmm. in and you know just well, I like this property and let me. <laughs> well, those are squatters too. I mean, they're, exactly. they're squatters. I mean, you take a risk. That's what squatting is, and, and you can be a squatter until somebody throws you out. Could be the city too who throws you out. Yeah. Because you don't have permission to be there, or because the property is blighted. And now the city mm -hmm. has the right to say you shouldn't be here. You know, I actually, you know, we, we, we have a couple of minutes left before okay. we have to go today. And I, actually, it's been fun. It's been I had a little bit too much coffee this morning. <laughs> it is really I early. Tell. Yeah. <laughs> but I, and you know, I enjoy this with you. Yes. Um, Nancy and I always are talking. Always. Uh, I just had, you know, we're talking about Detroit, etc., like blight. Uh, just a good segue is recently the city of Detroit just came out with um, new guidelines related to landlord inspections where the properties have to be inspected before they can let a tenant uh, move into the property. Now, Thank goodness. I'm not sure I'd have to just, you know, I saw it the other day. I actually put it up online. Mm -hmm. um, I think the laws are always been on the books, or it's been on the books as recently as the past five years. But now they've decided to enforce it. So I, anybody who's listening to this, you know, from a tenant perspective, I would, you know, I do run into, I have clients that come in, they're referred by real estate agents, etc., where um, they come in and they've been renting, and then it turns out that the property was not registered properly, and guess who has to leave, the tenant. Okay, that's been pro a big problem. And, uh, you know, then you try and find the owner. The owner's taking their money and also taking, let's say, their security deposit. There's a lot of good landlords and good real estate investors, mm -hmm. but the past several years have opened up the floodgates. I'll tell you with, um, they're really, they're non it's they're just not not available. There are people who come from all over the country. They buy property <coughs> online, and they don't, they just hold it as an investment. Wow. And they're absentee landlords, you would call them. So, um, or or they're not even the landlord. There's scams where they're, you know, somebody says oh, that they own the that, property. Yes. Yeah, that happens too. So it happens more often than you'd like to know. So one of the things is that properties need to be registered if you're going to be a tenant. You should go down to the city of Detroit and in any uh, municipality, go down and make sure um, that the property is registered. With, with the city as a rental because most cities now since 2008 have gotten smart. They want the properties to maintain the value. They want them, they don't want any blight and they want to know who's mm -hmm. responsible for the upkeep of the property. The most logical person is the landlord. So they have landlords now registering to, uh, once a year or once up say every three years uh, depending on the, the city mm -hmm. or township. Uh, these these landlords have to have their properties inspected by the city to make sure that it's That's yeah. It's, great. I think it's great. I mean, for both sides. I, I think, think so. I think so. I've had I've had some people say that it's a terrible thing. You know, landlords are 
clients say, I really don't like that. But you know what? Though, if you're a responsible landlord, nine times out of ten, it's just part of the business. you got to build it into your business plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll be happier because of it. Because if you buy a rental property and you don't take care of it, somebody next door buys a rental property and they're not taking care of it, now you got to, you know, you know right. not a good piece of property. Mm -hmm. So I think it helps values go up. And... Um, so for landlords, you need to know, and I have a couple out-of-state uh, clients right now who are dealing with the blight uh, issues and the blight ordinances with the city. Uh, the, uh, and one was a, an apartment building with like 60 units, and the city wants to shut them down. Now, me and a colleague are working with the city to uh, keep it open while they're doing the inspections. So it, it really helps both people, uh, parties. But I just want to let you know, mm -hmm. I, I just put something up regarding the city of Detroit. And I, w I actually, next week, will have online uh, a page devoted to all the cities in Michigan and townships. Um, who has the blight inspection and the landlord requirements uh, for registration? Oh, terrific. So that people can go online and take a look at that. That's great. Yeah, so it's a good thing to have. But um, we only have, whoops, we have four minutes left, four so minutes. let's wrap it up. Okay. It was the first. First you want to say, Dave, you've been really quiet. No. So. You know me, I like to, I like to, I'm a, I love to talk. Yes. Especially on a Saturday, there's less, I you know, I feel less pressure, you know. No there's phones ringing. No, no phones ringing. I actually did have a phone ring this morning. Somebody got yeah. my cell phone, which Ooh. was interesting. Uh, it's okay. It's but, okay. Uh, yeah, it's, this is a great time to have it because nobody is, you know, in the office technically. I mean, people are here working, but right. there's no phone calls coming through, mm -hmm. and which is nice. Um, one of the things, that, uh, getting back to the webinar, is that we'll be able to invite people to call in with the podcast. Um, I think it's easier if we just get people's questions and, and encourage people to send them in. I agree. Um, because I don't really have, like, an Alex to start playing around with the the controls and who's calling yes. in the phone and calls. And we can't do that. No, we're, we're just going to be honest about that. <laughs> I, we do a lot, but no, we don't. I don't think we can handle yes. that. And um, I don't know. So just please, please do send in questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's N. Phillips with two L's. Yes. And uh, at provenresource.com. And uh, you can also... Yeah. You can, or on our go on our Facebook page. Yeah. Facebook at Proven Resource. Mm -hmm. Um where else you can go right online and, and submit your questions to provenresource.com. Yeah, we've got a terrific um, web page. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Always yeah, being updated. Every, every year we update it, every so we got year. some new people working on it right now. Yeah. We have a uh, 20, it's called the 28, uh, pardon me, the 28 second chat, which is coming uh, in March, uh, which will allow people, if they go to the website, they can just click a button and it will dial in to one of the attorneys here who can take their call? Wow, that's Within cool. Within 28 seconds, you have I a return call. That. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's pretty slick. You know me trying to. You know, I know you. Give people. I know. Give that service. You give know? that service. And, and you can go on Google, or you can go on um, Social Survey. Uh, you can go on uh, what's the other one? Avo. I'm on Avo now. I found out. Uh, yeah. I answer questions there, and you know you can give and us reviews. And they can actually use the phone and call us at eight 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 seven eight nine one seven one five. <laughs> Triple eight seven eight nine one seven one five. You can also, if you're local, I mean, you can be out of state, but uh, it's a local number. It's two four eight five zero nine zero zero five zero. Susan Williams is uh, one of the head paralegals, and she takes all messages. Yes. Uh, so if you need to just leave a message, she does return them. She, Nancy, are you laughing? She had a very unfortunate spill a couple days ago, and we hope she gets better. And uh, she will. It's just we a, do. <laughs> we laugh. miss her around yeah. here. No, yeah, she'll be back. And she's uh, she is quite she, <laughs> If she's listening, she's going to be really pissed. I know. But um, <laughs> yeah, I hope her ankles, ankles, uh, are heal around the mend. Yes. Anyways, with that, fun. Yeah. and when are we going to do the next one, David? Well, we have the webinar again on the twentieth. I'd like to do. Yes. I'd like to do this on like the twenty fifth. And, um, okay. you know, we'll, we'll start monthly with this. And if it goes back to twice a month, I'm happy to do that as Super. well. Nancy, thanks for waking up. Hey, no problem, Dave. <laughs> You're not a morning person. It's always a joy to yeah. wake up every morning. Right, especially coming on a Saturday morning in Sydney. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's fun. I like it's it. Fun. So uh, we appreciate you listening. Uh, give us a call yeah. again, 888-789-1715, uh, Proven Resource. Our job pretty much is to reduce your uh, financial exposure and your legal exposure 
expenses when it comes to real estate and financial issues. And again, Dave Sobel and Nancy Phillips, have a great day. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Take care.